Um, hello everyone. Uh, as Wojtek mentioned, my name is Tomasz Kasprowicz and I'll be trying to moderate today's session about this uh, rather messy topic. Uh, um, our panelists today are Eddie Dinotai, Senior Fellow at the Center for Euro-Atlantic Integration and Democracy, Eulalia Rubio, Senior Research Fellow from Economic Social Affairs Jacques Delors Institute, and our own Martin L. from Hospodarskie Nowiny. Uh, I'm very glad to have you today on board. And um, let's try to unpack a little bit of uh, what's going on because we know the new financial framework is a mess. We are losing a, la a large net payer to the budget. So we have uh, uh, a pressure from the net payers not to incre increase their contribution. And we have, of course, huge appetites, or appetites of uh, net beneficiaries. And of course, as usual, every seven years those interests are clashing uh, and, uh, and we are trying to find some kind of middle ground and, and the question is what's the uh, state of play basically right now because we all we hear so far is that we have, that we have one after the other unsuccessful summits that bring us apparently no closer to a resolution. Eulalia would you be so nice as to introduce us to the current situation? Yeah, thank you, Thomas. Thank you for inviting me. It's very nice to have this possibility with the Zoom of uh, participating in a breakfast meeting that normally took place in Borso, actually. Um, let, me, let me just start maybe with uh, a, a brief overview or, or analysis of what has been proposed yesterday before entering into the political aspect, whether it will be approved or not. I think it's a very nice and intelligent proposal, the one that the Commission put on the table yesterday or the day before. Uh, technically speaking, from a macroeconomic perspective, it makes a lot of sense. We, leaving aside the question that I think it has been repeated uh, many times, that it's very intelligent to raise money now to pay the cost of the crisis or to pay it back later on and to use it in form of grants. And if you look in more detail how they are going to use this money, uh, the, the recovery uh, effort, it's going to be organized, structured in three pillars, which make a lot of sense. One pillar will be mainly to support member states' efforts in the recovery. One pillar will be to support directly firms. And the third pillar will be more to support, you know, the, further, the, thir the, the first and the second will be more about the economic cost of the crisis. And the third is more about the healthcare uh, crisis and how to tackle it. And what is very interesting also, if, if you look into the tail, the different programs that have been put into each pillar, there is also a logic of short-term versus long-term support. So for instance, in the first pillar, which is the main one, you have this facility, this recovery and resilience facility, that's gonna be the big one, the one that will give like 110 billion in grant to, to member states. But this facility, going to be take a bit of time to put into place because you have to do some national plans, recovery national plans. These national plans have to be approved. They have to be in line with the energy and climate plans, with just transition plans. So you have to expect this to take a bit of time to put into place. But you also have something that will be much more short term and much, much more quickly disbursed, which is this REACT, which is just extending the cohesion funding for two years with the same basis, the same legislative basis, and just changing, giving more flexibility to member states to use this funding and just changing the distribution key. So I think it's nice to see that there is this logic of something that is going to start quickly and this REACT actually, part of it will be already uh, disbursed this year, very small part of it, but still, I mean, you can already have some additional money to disburse. And the same for the second pillar, you have this solvency instrument that's going to start quickly and then you have, you know, invest EU and this strategic uh, instrument that's going to support the strategic uh, value change that is going to start 2021 and later on. So I think it's, it's nice the way that has been organized. Um, technically speaking, as I say, macroeconomically speaking, that makes sense. Politically speaking, from a point of, political point of view, I think it's also very intelligent what the Commission has proposed because you see that there has been, you know, a, <clears throat> an attempt to try to balance different interests in the recovery effort because you have this big pot that is the, the facility, the recovery facility that mainly will go to the most affected countries, but also REACT that will be a bit distributed differently and that will take take. Count also, it, it will take account of the crisis, but also 
taking into account the differences in levels of, of, of development among member states. And also there is this top up of other programs that probably will benefit countries that are less affected directly by the crisis, like Rural Development Fund and uh, Just Transition Fund. And uh, so, so politically, it's also good to see that they, they have tried to balance all these, all these details. And also with the remaining MFF, because we have this package, we have the recovery effort, we have the remaining MFF. In the remaining MFF, what we see that the Commission has tried to do, first, it has to be quite, it has been pragmatic and modest in some sense, because it hasn't taken as point of departure their own proposal of May 2018, uh, but the February 2020 proposal that was the one that was closer to agreement. And we see that the overall size is more or less the same than the one that Charles Michel proposed in February. And we just see that the Commission tried to rebalance some spending, also taking profit that, you know, some of the spending that was in the MFF now will be very much in the recovery effort. And this supplementary space is used by the Commission to, let's say, correct some of the cuts that were proposed by Charles Michel in migration, in defense funding, in Erasmus, in some of the programs. Now, there, politically, let's see what will happen. Of course, it's a very ambitious uh, proposal and there is uh, a lot also to cut if you want, because we are, we are uh, actually, we are responding a bit to the demands of the Parliament that was maintaining FMF, MFF at the same level, plus topping up with this big uh, recovery effort. So I expect uh, in, the, in the political negotiation to, to, there will be a compromise and there will be maybe concessions and there will be maybe cuts some, in some places. So in some sense, it's ambitious, but it's also politically intelligent, if you want, because that gives also space to concessions and to compromises. Uh, so I, I leave it here, and then I mean I, I haven't said anything about own resources, but maybe we can come up uh, to this later. Well, this is uh, this proposal is uh, kind of a change of the gameplay, basically, because uh, the big question is uh, if we are so starved for money for the budget, where is this big pot coming from? Yes, so that we are now sharing in between, as nobody wants to contribute and. Uh, of course, this is a complete new uh, a new idea for the European Union funding that was opposed for so long by the Germany, basically. Um, Edith, can you uh, try to elaborate uh, whether this is uh, um, an idea of going out of the crisis or this is a permanent switch or just a one-time event for the case of, of, of the pandemics? Yeah, thank you very much and um, I'm very happy to be with you. Um, good morning from Budapest. Well, actually, I think this is really a change of directions uh, from the part of the Commission. Uh, and I would consider it as a pretty bold and brave move. Um, it came rather fast, um, kind of reacting to the criticism that the Commission was not uh, on the top of this whole uh, crisis management concerning the um, the corona crisis that they did not react on time well they actually put together this huge package rather fast which is unusual from the commission uh, of course it was it was something already proposed by the germans and the french together which helps uh, to facilitate and push things through nevertheless the first pact was just around 50 billion and now we are talking about a rec uh, recovery fund of 750 billion euros, which is huge. Okay, um, there is this distribution of, um, 50, uh, of uh, 500 million billion probably for grants and the rest for loans. I think there is still a lot of negotiation on that. Uh, what would be the, um, the exact share? But what's really new is that um, this money is not going to come from the budget, as you said, but this money is going to be raised on the international financial markets, which is a move uh, towards debt sharing, uh, which was something uh, that was rejected by Germany and by the so-called net players or net contributors uh, for such a long time. So I think it's also a lesson or it shows that the EU or the Commission uh, learned the lesson from the last economic crisis, the last the financial crisis, where they definitely did not react very fast and let many of those southern countries um, suffer for a long time. There was this tug of war, who is responsible? Well, this is a difficult, different situation because now 
you cannot really say that Spain and Italy uh, was or were responsible for uh, being hit by the corona crisis. This is something that uh, even Central European Eurosceptics would not dare to say, um, hopefully. So this is something where we have to share responsibility and we have to share the costs. Well, it definitely goes um, against those countries which advocate a more sovereignist view in the EU. So it would be very interesting, maybe we can talk about that in the next round, um, what the approach of um, Central European countries to this recovery fund is, just to give you um, just um, uh, uh, an idea. Um, the Hungarian Prime Minister Orban um, uh, had his um, interview, um, the famous radio interview, which he always has on Friday, and he said, well, we have to be very careful and cautious with this new recovery uh, fund, uh, because the loans have to be repaid uh, by the member states, just, you know, alluding to the fact that if somebody uh, would not be able to service this debt, then it should be uh, repaid by other member states. So he is already thinking in 30 years uh, time. And I think, you know, the reason behind that is that um, most Central Europeans and Orban himself just wants to maximize revenues. So he wants to push for more. He wants to get his uh, chunk from the, from the fund. But I think we will talk about that later with Martin. Uh, well, yes, indeed. Uh, our government seems very happy. Uh, I mean, Polish government seems very happy with the proposal and portraying it as uh, their negotiation success. Uh, however strange it may it sound because there was no real negotiations yet that, that, that much. Um, uh, and of course, uh, as our Eurosceptics uh, uh, as they are, uh, they are always happy to get more money. But probably we need a little bit more nuanced perspective on the response of the uh, V4 to, to, to this uh, negotiations, uh, not only limited, of course, to this uh, um, uh, rebuild fund. Martin, could you elaborate on that? Oh, yes. Thank you. Good morning uh, from Prague. Um, thank you for the invitation for this interesting debate. Uh, yes, uh, we have a, a lot of new nuances. Uh, I would start with uh, one only com the only common point of Visegrad 4 at this moment is they all want, want some money uh, they, and they are really not uh, willing to make some compromises as Eulalia put uh, uh, that the, the design of the of the fund and, 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 and all the proposal is that there is a lot of space for the compromise and I'm afraid that we will need a lot of compromises towards the Central Europe. Uh, we can for, for example have seen uh, yesterday there was a special interview of President of the European Commission with the Czech TV, because the Czech Prime Minister Andrei Babiš is one of those who is objecting that most, because of this uh, kind of uh, selfish uh, stance that uh, we don't want to give, we, we only want to want to take some money. And I think it's this is a common approach, mostly with Slovaks and and, and Hungarians, while the Polish government is a little a little bit different situation because. Polish government was on the only one from the region which was able to put something on the table as a, some proposals of uh, European taxes. So while the Czechs and Slovaks uh, and Hungarians were not, you know, proposing anything, only objecting. So this is this is uh, one thing. Uh, the other thing is that, uh, that there are quite a lot of differences in in, uh, in the stances of the government towards the proposal. So. I think we cannot speak about some kind of Visegrad for common position as it was in the migration crisis because everybody will be uh, uh, looking at the, at the money differently. Uh, Czech Prime Minister is probably the most uh, vocal or the, the, the hardest hardest uh, refusing of, of, the, of, the, of, the, of the European Commission proposal because uh, he really looks at that as a, from the really pure position of businessman, you know, he wants to maximize the profit and not to give anything in, 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 in exchange, which will put him in conflict with, for example, Germans who are in naturally leader in, in the situation and uh, at the same time, the most important uh, business partner for the, for the Central Europe. Uh, Slovaks uh, to lesser extent because they, they don't have a kind of unified position on that. 
because there's a new government and the, the, this government is struggling with the COVID crisis and internally and they don't have a kind of common European approach and Prime Minister is not, Prime Minister Igor Matovic is not quite interested in the European affairs, so he will leave them uh, mostly to the Minister of Foreign Affairs, Igor Korchuk, who is, uh, Ivan Korchuk, who is a uh, um, staunch pro-European um, politician or carry diplomat with the pro-European. So we can expect uh, a lot of uh, nuanced uh, negotiations from the Slovaks with one clear message that even their uh, COVID crisis was not so bad in terms of uh, number of deaths and, and, and uh, infected people, they, they were hardly hit in the economic terms, so they will, uh, they will need a lot of, a lot of money. Uh, and about Hungarian um, approach, we have we have uh, heard, and I think it will be uh, it will not be so vocal as the Czech one, because I I think that the Hungarian Prime Minister will not try to provoke backlash on mm. on this specific front, uh, because he will do his own policies at home, so he will some kind of uh, walk on the tightrope uh, as he knows how to do that very perfectly. Okay. Uh, and I would, uh, I would uh, maybe stop with one, one more point, uh, which is uh, uh, often mentioned by the Czech Prime Minister. It's it's connected with all of all, all, all four countries, where uh, and I, I have to apologize to all others, you know, for the Czech uh, Czech Prime Minister's stance because it's so selfish, in a sense that he is not admitting, you know, to talk about uh, you know help to indebted countries. Because he says that um, uh, the Czech Republic is the, I think, the third or fourth the, uh, uh, less indebted country in the uh, European Union, and I was interested in, uh, by the by the recent analysis of Center for European Reform, which made estimate uh, about how how much the uh, EU countries will get into debt uh, 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 when dealing with this COVID COVID situation, and uh, it was last week uh, estimation, and uh, from their chart chart. Which I don't know how to share in the, in the chat, uh, but I can uh, later on. Uh, it uh, the Czech Republic uh, will come out of that as a least and indebted country of the EU, uh, according to their estimation, uh, and less uh, very low service uh, service debt. Uh, and all four countries, I mean Poland, Czech Republic, Slovakia, and Hungary, are in the in the in the half, which is. Uh, Less affected by this indebtedness than the rest of the EU. Uh, on the on the other side, there is uh, Ita Italy, Greece, and Portugal as the most indebted countries of their chart. So, uh, so this is the logic of, of of the Czech Prime Minister, and I think it will be uh, to great extent also the logic of the Slovaks. While I think the Hungarians and, and Poles will have a different approach to that, but uh, uh, I would warn our European colleagues you know, to expect the Czech Prime Minister. Uh, really arguing about the debt quite a lot, which re resembles to great extent the Slovak uh, government from 2011 as a fresh EU Eurozone member who was pushed towards sharing the um, uh, debt uh, uh, in case Greece would uh, supposed to be uh, paid. Uh, and th th this led to the fall of the Slovak government because uh, because the couple of parties in, in that coalition uh, refused. And uh, again, warning shot, uh, the same guy who put the government down in 2011, uh, Richard Sulik, is now vice uh, prime minister of Slovakia. Yeah, that's the politics always complicated around those parts of the woods. Uh, well, the situation that we have with basically zero interest rates, um, not sure if you noticed, but yesterday Polish Central Bank also uh, decreased our rates to 0.1%. I don't know why they did bother to keep it above zero, <laughs> but they did. Um, basically, we, have, we are facing zero interest rates, so it means the debt's for free, uh, which would mean that basically all of the funding problems are gone at this point. Yet still, EU budget, at least, has this zero, uh, zero debt policy. And um, of course, uh, with these uh, this, uh, negotiations, we have a discussion of the new sources of revenues and own uh, revenue sources. Uh, and um, they, uh, Martin already mentioned that uh, Poland is proposing some ideas, not that they are very good, but there are at least some ideas. 
Um, and the question is, what else on the table? Can you can you talk about a, a little bit, Olalia? Yeah, indeed, there there are, there is a proposal to create new on resources. Maybe first, uh, let me say that we know for the past that creating new on resources is incredibly difficult. It is incredibly difficult on, on, at the EU level. It has uh, there has been uh, endless attempt to change the system of own resources and, uh, and, and all of them have failed in the past. Uh, why? Because many member states are very reluctant to, to lose control on how much, uh, how it is financed uh, the, the, the EU budget. The, the fact of being financed by national contributions, of course, it's very negative in terms of, you know, um, visibility in the sense that it is clear that you're paying for the EU budget so you can do the net return calculus and and that can create some real skepticism but at the same time from the point of view of ministers of finance you control very well how much do you put on the money you put uh, on the EU budget whereas if you accept on resources based on different rates applied to economic activities that take place in your country you you lose a bit this control so so there is always this reluctancy from some member states to create. And then the problem is also uh, from a legal perspective, because on resource decision, you have to, you need the unanimity in the European uh, Council, but you need the ratification of all national parliaments. So, and that takes a lot of time. And that means that any type of national parliament can block uh, the introduction of a new, a new on resource. Now, the, the, the Commission knows that the, they have to put this, this proposal. I think it's good that they put it. And, also, they have to put it because the parliament has explicitly said that they will ask for a reform, uh, a meaningful reform of armed resources to give their consent. And it makes a lot of sense, of course, because uh, as the parliament has said, well, we are raising new debt and it would be nice if part of this new debt that we have raised can be uh, can be financed, partially financed by own resources and not directly by member states. Uh, what they have done, though, they have they have presented the same resources they presented in the last time. So ETS, the emission trading system, you know, the, the excess uh, of the average of uh, the member states receive, uh, a simplified BT, BAT uh, tax. Uh, but then they have they have proposed new ones. They have proposed this new one, digital tax. They have proposed a new one based on large companies, but they haven't given a lot of uh, a lot of uh, an accord, an, 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 a tax on carbon adjustment, a carbon adjustment border tax. They haven't uh, given a lot of detail on this tax, and they haven't given a lot of detail also because they propose to introduce this later on, not right now. So the the, the the proposal of the Commission is not to start 2021 with new taxes, which would be really unrealistic because you need to, to, to do a, the design of the tax and you need the approval, as I say, of all national parliaments. But to start exploring these proposals and posing the question in 2024 when we will finish with this recovery effort. Uh, and that gives a lot, a bit of time also to, I think it's, a, it's also an intelligent move because you put on the negotiation this, you, you, you know, you, you drop these ideas and then you create uh, you know, the, the, the context to start exploring these, these new proposals. But you have a bit of time to you know, come up with a, with a clear proposal and then discuss among member states whether it is good or not. Uh, so I think there is some chances, but as I say, I am quite skeptical, generally speaking, on, on changes in on resources because it's always very difficult and we have almost never uh, seen in the last 20 years much uh, changes on on resource system yeah that's not very reassuring going forward uh, <laughs> uh, it, it, it's also a question because uh, this relief effort is a complete game changer well as we know we have those euro skeptics uh, in the eu and they are always complaining for eu to do too much and sometimes doing too little and sometimes both at the same time um, this Effort uh, seems to be a very practical, needed, and welcomed uh, event from many point of views, and almost by all of the countries, bearing in mind that they, of course, disagree about the details. Uh, uh, but from the other point of view, it's also one of the biggest uh, unifying events in in uh, uh, European Union uh, since the Euro crisis, uh, since the introduction of Euro. Well, the, the, the question is, uh, what will be the impact politically of, of, of these uh, ideas and, and whether this will strengthen the European Union? Is it an escape to the forward, as we say in Poland? So we are trying to escape our crisis by, by moving very quickly 
uh, forwards and uh, is it going to be impulsed for integration or quite the other way around? What, what are your ideas and thoughts at it? Well, I think this offers a good opportunity for moving forward together uh, in, in like a joint European Union. Um, the question is, of course, the timing, um, because the money is needed now for most of the economies. Uh, and I'm a bit skeptical about whether this money will come just right in time when it's needed or not, you know, two years later or three years later. It will be still needed, but now we really have a fresh crisis. Um, and of course, the question is, um, how, how this idea can pull together the European Union. We, we already know that not just Central Europe, but there are the so-called frugal states, which are uh, quite a bit uh, against this idea, especially uh, the Netherlands. So it's not just Central Europe, which plays um, a negative role in this game, but the Netherlands, partly Austria, which is considered a, um, a pro-European country, but uh, in, in this game, they are also trying to, um, to balance, and um, Denmark and Sweden. So the question is, uh, what could be offered to those countries as an offset uh, to support this uh, recovery fund? At the end of the day, I think it will succeed, it will sail. Uh, but the question is how long this is going to take. Um, it needs unanimity as it is part of the EU's budget. So everybody has to vote for it. Um, and it will take time. I think it's, uh, it's over optimistic to think that it can sail through this summer, which would be needed, but uh, I, I don't think there is a realistic chance for that. Uh, maybe in the autumn, and a lot depends on um, the German EU presidency, which is taking up the, the EU presidency from July, uh, how hard they will push for that and how good they can balance. Um, this is the last term of Angela Merkel, so she can actually uh, work for her European legacy now and not for um, internal political uh, stakes in Germany, but she also has to keep in mind that elections are coming up next year in Germany. Uh, nobody knows uh, who is going to lead the CDU, who is going to be the successor of Angela Merkel. So there are those uh, inter-German dynamics and not even talking about the French uh, internal situation. Um, so I think there are many, many, many unknown factors. Um, we all know that the German Constitutional Court um, kind of blocked the euro bonds or actually asked the European Central Bank to specify and um, explain why those bonds are necessary. So this is um, showing also the, the spirit, the atmosphere in Germany about giving more powers to, to the Commission and the, the, the doubts about that. Um, so it's going to be a long game, uh, but I think, um, you know, most of the countries uh, have a vested interest in uh, having this recovery fund uh, started and, um, and Europe should really move forward as a united community, uh, especially if we see all international developments, what's happening in the US, what's happening with transatlantic relations um, with China, with Asia. So I think this is also a prime moment for the European Union to, to really join forces and emerge as a, I wouldn't say um, a world power, but like a mid power in, in international relations. Well, there is also a, a question that we are facing right now is, of course, we know uh, the ongoing quarrels between uh, uh, some Visegrad countries uh, and uh, the Commission about the rule of law. Um, there is also a question whether this instrument might be used to, toward pressuring those governments to botch, taking into consideration there is so much at stake. Uh, um, uh, do you think um, this tool will be used or this whole rule of law thing will be probably uh, forgotten and taking into consideration we have bigger problems uh, to deal with? W what's your take, uh, Martin? I'm afraid that uh, it will be a, a little bit pushed in the background because as, as, you, as you said, you know, it's something bigger in stake at this moment. It's this uh, kind of economic survival and the uh, uh, survival of the unity of EU. And, and uh, uh, I think especially when we, uh, we will have a German presidency, 
uh, the Germans will, will as, um, as they know how to deal with Orban the best in, in the Europe. So they will, they will try to, they will try to, you know, not to push too much uh, on, on that front. Uh, in Poland, I think it will depend on, on the internal development after the presidential elections. Or we will see uh, that uh, if, uh, it's a big if, of course, uh, if, if, the, if the president Duda will continue, then we, we, we might expect some kind of uh, uh, quarrels with, uh, with the EU as well to continue in the sense that uh, the governing party will see, uh, uh, will see itself str strong enough to deal, to deal with that. But uh, and at the same time, Poland is the most skilled uh, negotiator out of four on the EU scene. So uh, they, will, they will try and, and they know, for example, we didn't mention so far the Green Deal okay. issue when, uh, where in, in which the Poland has uh, the biggest stake. Uh, so, so kind of a change of the economy and, and to the from, from the coal oriented to more greenish or greenish oriented, and uh, the poles are uh, planning a lot in in this direction to again to extract as much money as possible from the EU on, on, on this on this purpose. So I wouldn't expect from the Polish government to go in in uh, in, in, in this sense uh, on, on the big on the big fight if they will see that there is a chance to get some money. Uh, so, uh, and to, to, to the great extent that this, this is also valid for the Hungary. So I wouldn't ex expect that this will be kind of a prime issue uh, for the next half a year if, uh, because the unity of the EU, at least the basic one, will be much more, uh, much more uh, important for, from the point of view of, of Brussels or, or the big, uh, big capitals like Berlin or France. Uh, yeah, so uh, of course, um, a lot of depends on the coming elections uh, here and there, and also in the United States for that matter. Mm. Um, uh, thank you for your uh, ideas. I think it's time to turn uh, towards the Q&A session. So, Valentin, please take over and, and please uh, uh, introduce and, and, and moderate the, the, the second session. Thank you very much.